any Cavs fans in the audience? No? I'm the only one? I grew up in Cleveland, so today is a very happy day for me. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so I think we're ready to start. So I'm uh, Greg Corrala. I'm a part of our business development team and our big data analytics. And joining me today is Melanie, Raj, and Lige. Um, so we'll introduce them as they kind of get to their sessions, their sections. So we wanted to talk today about the session is called Easy Analytics. Um, and first, we're going to talk about some AWS services that help enable um, analytics in terms of managed services, where you don't have to manage the infrastructure yourselves. And then uh, Melanie will then go through a demonstration of the things that I review. And then probably most interesting, uh, Raj and Lige will uh, talk about their actual experiences using uh, many of these tools that we discuss, and then we'll take some, some questions. So kind of a packed agenda, so we'll try to uh, move quickly. And um, probably best if we kind of keep questions to the end, just so we can get through uh, the material and hear our, our guest speakers. Um, and then we're happy to, I know as crowded as it might be, to try to meet in the hallway if there's questions, you know, when we, if we run out of time at the end. So I think when we think about uh, big data analytics uh, at AWS, um, obviously a lot of times, particularly if you're new to AWS or maybe new to cloud computing, you think of compute storage and networking as basic primitives, of course, which allows you to install and configure your analytics uh, tool set of choice, just essentially uh, presenting to you a, Windows, a, a Linux or Windows environment. Um, but then the team that I represent at AWS, we think about you know, a database as an endpoint or uh, a big data analytics as an endpoint, right? Where you don't have to manage the installation, configuration, patching, backups, high availability, all these you know, super critical tasks that are involved in analytic architectures, but now we present to you the endpoint, and then depending upon your use case, whether it's a relational, non-relational file, unstructured data, we have many different choices for you to uh, you know, solve the particular problem set that you're looking at. So uh, my background is I spent you know, a majority of my career at Oracle, um, in, in which case it was you know, simple, right? Because you know, whatever the, the, the solution or the problem was, the solution was you know, put it in the Oracle database, right? And so this is uh, a little bit different where when you first kind of look at this slide, you know, we think, well, this is complex, right? Because there's many different options in terms of collecting data, storing it, analyzing it. And you know which tool do I need to you know use to solve my problem? And this is a deliberate you know approach that we take at AWS, thinking that there's not one single uh, tool to meet all needs. So we want to think carefully about the use case, and then use our reference architectures or guidance or just your own knowledge to essentially test and evaluate. And because you know you, the the barrier to entry is fairly low, such that you can experiment you know very quickly and easily to understand what the right match of, of architectures are to solve your individual needs, right? Uh, so um, instead of kind of thinking of it from a service perspective, so at AWS we say services, oftentimes you might think of products, so we call them, call them services, meaning, you know, relational database, non-relational, big data, data warehousing are all services to us. Um, so we wanted to take a little bit different approach to this talk and think about uh, personas or different roles in your organization and how they uh, can leverage some of these different tool sets. And we kind of think, you know, simplistically about, you know, three different ones that I'll walk through here. So the first one is kind of a business intelligence analyst, the second is a data scientist, and the third is application developer. And what these all have in common is they want to derive analytics or derive value from, from data uh, that is uh, part of their AWS ecosystem. So the first is from the AWS, uh, or sorry, from the BI analyst perspective, uh, the key thing here is to think about is the primary language that this person speaks is SQL, right? So um, you know, they maybe come from a data warehousing background or, you know, relational database background, but their day-to-day -day tool set is in the SQL-based uh, tools, either coding SQL themselves or using BI tools like Tableau or Looker or Cognos or, you know, MicroStrategy, the whole long list of visual BI tools. But fundamentally, you know, they want to think about uh, uh, presenting, you know, or getting their answers out of, out of uh, databases using SQL. And, of course, there's a couple of options. Uh, the first is, you know, you can install and configure your BI tool or stack of choice using Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2. And we have many customers that have lots of success, both with our partner uh, from our Amazon uh, or AWS uh, marketplace or by installing it and configuring it themselves on, on EC2. Uh, but the two key components from a managed service perspective that, we'll just, that I'll kind of dive into a little bit here are Amazon QuickSight, which is our visualization tool, and then uh, Redshift, which is our, our data warehouse. 
So just uh, quickly, just curious, how many people have heard of Redshift? Okay, so most of the room. Okay, so I'll kind of go quickly. So Redshift, of course, is our managed data warehouse. Um, it presents itself as a Postgres uh, database, uh, meaning that any BI tool or any kind of uh, analytic tool that understands Postgres database can work with Redshift. But of course, underneath the covers, uh, Redshift is much different than Postgres, right? So it just presents itself as a Postgres database. And really, it's a MPP columnar database. So massively parallel processing, you can start with as small as 160 gigabytes and then, you know, seamlessly grow, nearly seamlessly grow to potentially multiple petabytes of data. And of course, you only pay for the capacity you're currently using and you're essentially being able to pay for that by the hour. So um, provides, you know, many benefits. Oftentimes we say it's about one-tenth the cost of traditional uh, data warehouse platforms. Some customers see, you know, dramatic savings um, above that one-tenth but delivers you know, superior performance through its columnar database structure, meaning that each individual uh, column in your table is a separate file, so if a query comes in, we're only gonna have to read from disk the actual columns that are part of that query. We take advantage of high compression for columns. Um, and it's widely used, um, everything from you know, startups all the way to Fortune 500 uh, in, in um, education space as well as public sector many different use cases. It actually has been our fastest growing service at AWS, which really speaks to the, the value that customers have, have derived from Redshift from a data warehousing perspective. And we'll hear some uh, stories here as we, we move forward. Um, and then of course, what's nice is that it's tightly integrated with S3. So if you're familiar with S3, simple storage service, oftentimes this becomes a landing place for data to then load into Redshift. Um, and so backups are also taken to Redshift and Essentially, you can think about it as this MPP or massively parallel processing uh, data warehouse as a managed service, meaning you just look at the database as an endpoint, uh, but we manage the backups, configuration, patching. A lot of that undifferentiated effort is now provided just as part of the Redshift service itself. Um, and of course, you know, moving beyond just simple uh, you know, data warehousing, you have the ability to extend uh, the um, uh, Redshift language or SQL language by functions that we add in as part of the native uh, um, language of Redshift. So here's just kind of a list of some functions that we've recently added in terms of analytics. Uh, we continue to iterate on this. Um, if there's functions that uh, you are using today that aren't part of uh, the Redshift uh, SQL, please let us know. Uh, you can go into our Redshift forum and request them. But this really talks about some ways that beyond just simple queries, you can start deriving uh, deeper analytics. Um, and taking that one step further, we also have the idea of user-defined functions. So um, as we kind of build native functions on that previous slide, you also have the ability to write your own function in Python 2.7. Um, and this allows you to now embed analytics directly in the database by leveraging the, the scale-out architecture of Redshift to actually execute your Python code directly with the data and then get your result sets back. And there's some uh, a number of different examples we can kind of walk through, but uh, for simplicity, I think if you go to uh, the aws.amazon.com slash redshift um, um, page, you'll see lots of examples and links to more in-depth analysis. But the, the point is that by extending the SQL language through Python, you can really get um, advanced analytics embedded in the database, but for your subscriber set information, they simply access that through a simple SQL function and they don't have to know the underlying details of implementation. Uh, so let's talk about Redshift uh, quickly. Uh, we'll hear more about it um, in, a, in a few minutes and from our customer uh, testimonials. But uh, the other one that's, that's in preview today, so Redshift has been around for about three and a half years. Um, a service that we announced back at reInvent, so last October, it's currently in uh, preview, meaning it's kind of our word for beta or early access, um, is Amazon QuickSight. So we looked at the business intelligence marketplace and said, well, you know, in that example of running your BI tool on, on EC2, you essentially have to install, configure, and patch it, right? Whereas with QuickSlight, we want to abstract that complexity of maintaining the infrastructure and just allow you to use a BI tool as an endpoint, just like we have services for databases as an endpoint. Uh, so hopefully, I, don't know, I guess the colors are a little bit uh, um, strange on the slide here, but the basic idea is that you know we want to be able to not only provide a managed service around BI, meaning that we provision the infrastructure for you. You don't have to install, configure, or patch software. But also we want to broaden the, the, the amount of, or the, the number of data sources you have. So whether it's relational, non-relational, file, API, either an AWS data source or even on-premise, you should be able to access it. So if it's a Mongo database, or if it's uh, Oracle, or SQL Server, or Redshift, 
or if it's just simply a file sitting on S3, uh, we want to be able to do analytics on top of that. And then through that, we essentially enable this layer that we call SPICE, which is super fast parallel in-memory calculation engine. So between your user interface and your database, uh, you have this uh, horizontally scalable in-memory data structures that you can populate with data. Or if it's a relational source, you can send the query directly to that source as well. Um, but this, this in-memory cache can provide super fast access from the user interface. And then this cache can actually be exposed to our user interface, meaning the QuickSight UI, or through partner BI tools such as Tableau and TIBCO. Uh, so the SPICE layer can appear, well, soon will be appearing as a SQL data source itself. Um, and then we also want to have, from the QuickSight UI perspective, uh, full support for mobile, um, either tablet or phone devices as well. So whether you're on a PC or a tablet, you should have the same, same user experience. And so QuickSight, from a BI perspective, will be a real enabler to enable easy analytics with, with AWS. So I kind of quickly went through that first uh, uh, scenario of the BI analyst. So the next one I want to talk about is the data scientist. And so really thinking about that BI analyst, their, their primary language is SQL. They primarily use you know, relational data stores like Redshift. Um, and we contrast this to a data scientist is that the data scientist now is more of a, a programmer, right? So they have potentially advanced uh, degrees in mathematics or at least a, a deep understanding of mathematics. And they want to be able to install a toolkit. Oftentimes this could be a commercial application like SAS. Uh, so systems like Redshift uh, fully support SAS Connect so you can run SAS on, on EC2. Or increasingly we see popularity of R. So R is a statistical programming language where a data scientist can actually uh, build, test, and validate their own models using a widely available uh, programming uh, uh, construct called R to be able to do advanced analytics, predictive analytics, sort of um, moving into a little bit of, of uh, um, looking forward into the future and then doing that in a, in a programmatic way using the R, R language. And so uh, by connecting these two, so thinking about Redshift as your data warehouse and then uh, R as really your predictive modeling toolkit, uh, there's lots of uh, open source uh, tools to be able to connect R directly from uh, Redshift. And I know that we'll provide these slides uh, later, but at the bottom in, in tiny print is a blog post that actually goes through in detail of how to uh, set up and configure uh, connecting R to, to Redshift and some examples to be able to embed more advanced analytics and combining that with your structured data in Redshift or even data on, on S3. Uh, so here again, I guess this is uh, probably a, kind of a horrible uh, a screenshot looking at it on the screen, but this is just looking at RStudio. So if you know R programming language, uh, essentially it's an R package that's connecting to a Redshift database and it's doing a, a histogram on, on data. It's kind of a simpler, simplistic example of connecting R. Uh, so from a data scientist perspective, they don't necessarily know other than the connection details that they're connecting to R it's just, or connecting to Redshift. They're using the tool that's familiar to them, in this case, RStudio, to define their analytics out of, out of Redshift. Uh, so we went through quickly the BI developer, the, uh, the data scientist, and the third one is application developer. So what makes application developer unique is that they're not a PhD in, in math or they don't necessarily have deep learning in terms of or a deep understanding of uh, programming languages, uh, statistical programming languages. But what they do know are application development. So they know Java or they know uh, Python, whatever you know, toolkit they're using to actually develop an application. And so to enable these uh, uh, persons to be able to find analytics or advanced analytics, we have something called the Amazon Machine Learning Service that Melanie will go through a demonstration of where you essentially access these advanced mathematical techniques through an API. Right? So you don't have to have that deep knowledge or understanding of, uh, of the actual implementation, but now you can leverage it to embed predictive analytics in your application. And uh, this is a sort of an example of a service that on our retail side of Amazon, we developed, enabled, and widely used where you could think about you know, some of the, the classic examples on Amazon.com of being able to, I should stop moving my hands so much, I keep flipping slides, uh, where you know, we have this, uh, a small uh, you know, army, let's say, of, of application developers that are developing and testing new components to our Amazon.com retail side. They want to embed uh, you know, advanced analytics or predictive analytics directly into it uh, so they can you know, use this machine learning service internally so it's actually built and tested at fairly large scale with you know, one of the biggest online retailers in the world. But now we uh, commercialize that and make it available to our customers to essentially take that same 
API view of predictive analytics and embed it in their applications as they're developing it, whether it's a mobile application, a web application, you can actually leverage the power of machine learning simply through, through an API. So that just kind of gave a little bit of, a, of an overview. So next, uh, Melanie is going to go through a quick demonstration of some of the things that we just saw. But so kind of the summary of my section is you looked at all those different services that we have for advanced analytics, whether it's relational, non-relational, or um, API-based sources, and thinking about, you know, in terms of not just the products or the services, but the individual roles, and then differentiating between, you know, a BI analyst, a data scientist, and application developers, and helping that kind of uh, view really guide your decision in terms of what actual underlying products or services can be construed to build your, your application or define your analytics. Uh, so next, uh, Melanie's going to go through a demo. Hopefully, it'll show up on the screen. Uh, to be able to kind of put this, tie this together uh, and maybe a little bit more visual and, and, and example. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Malini Saxena. I am a senior consultant with AWS. Uh, so we are going to talk about a use case that is based on publicly accessible data. This, uh, the use case is really the flight and weather data that we have publicly ac accessible. And we're going to download and use that to predict the delays in flight. This is the architecture we'll be using. Uh, can you go back, please? Thank you. Uh, we're going to take the data and then stage it into an S3 bucket. From there, we're going to copy that data into the Redshift database. And I'm going to show you a script that I use to do that. We have two sets of data. One is the training data that I'm going to take that from the Redshift and feed that into machine learning and write uh, you know, and go through the process of actually creating a machine learning model. We use that model, get the results from there, stage that into an S3 bucket, and then using the model and a full data set, we're going to run and get the predictions on the entire data set using machine learning. And in the end, we're going to use QuickSight for visualization. So different parts, and I know the demo will probably move a little bit fast. If you have questions after this, Please let me know. I'm going to be outside, and uh, we can talk about the details of the demo. Uh, let's go forward. Thank you. So the first step is I already have the data staged in S3. So this is the Redshift console. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this very well. This is the console where you're going to create a Redshift database. Uh, after you've created the database, you will connect to it like I am using DB Visualizer. You could use any tool that can connect to a database. This is the uh, script I'm using. There's a copy command. I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but I think we can share the screens later on. This is the example of the UDF function that we talked about. So uh, it's a function that I've created in Python, and what it's doing is trying to calculate the delays, that uh, the number of days from a holiday, from a public holiday. And what I, why I'm doing that is I want to use that as part of my columns to see if uh, a public holiday actually have an impact on a flight delay. So if you see that uh, in the test or flights, I'm using that column as uh, based on that uh, function. So we're going to see how it later impacts our predictions. And then there is another example after we have the predictions to how do you copy it back into the redshift structure. So now this is the machine learning console. The first thing we're going to do is create a new data source based on redshift and a machine learning model based on the data source that we created. So the very first thing is you tell it that you want to have your model based on a Redshift database that holds my training data. You're going to fill in the cluster details. It already identifies that I already have a demo cluster here. Fill in the details, and the uh, important information you need to give here is the IAM role, so security, obviously, how it's going to connect. You can create a new role, or you can use the one that's already there. I have a role already created that I will be using. You'll give it a S3 bucket location to store the prediction, and a SQL query that points to your training data set. So I just give a simple select star from my training data set and verify that. And once I do that, it's going to go into the database with the access role and actually extract the columns that these are the columns that it has extracted. So you can keep it like this, or if you want to make a change. So for example, for me, I'm going to change that. Excuse me. It's going to go back up again. So I'm going to change that variable to a, a binary variable. 
because I'm trying to determine whether or not a flight is delayed. So it was set up as a uh, numerical. I think we need to go back. Back, back, go to back, yeah. Uh, just one more step back, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, next step is we are selecting a target variable. Target variable is the variable that we are trying to predict using machine learning. So here, uh, my target variable that I'm selecting is the departure delay, whether or not a flight is delayed. Uh, can you play this? I don't think it's being played. Thank you. So here, we're going to use, we're going to find a target variable, which is the variable that I just defined as a binary variable. And optionally, you can give it a row identifier. A row identifier is necessary if you want to go back and tie back the predictions to the exact row that was causing. So I know uh, we are going really, really fast here, but what I've been trying to do so far, so is you create a data uh, database in the back, you load the base data in it, and then we're just going through the machine learning steps. Right now, the steps that we're running through is creating a data source. The next step is you feed that data source into machine learning model. Here you can see it has a binary model type selected, and that's because my variable that I'm trying to predict is, uh, is binary. We ensure that we have the you know, right data source available, and there are other advanced settings like the number of passes you wanna go for or the model size. I'm just selecting the defaults, but you could go ahead and for your particular data set, modify these values. After the model is created, because it's created on my test data, I have to verify, make sure that the model has the right kind of output, right? So I have to see how it performed. If you look in the evaluations, you're gonna see that uh, in the summary section, it will tell you that the score I got, performance metric, I got like a score of 0.76, which is considered good for a binary classification model. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna reduce, a model like this is gonna have false positives and false negatives, right? So you're gonna reduce false positives in IKs because a false positive for a flight delay means that a flight is reported delayed when it's not. So that means people are gonna miss their flight. So you make the changes to the threshold value based on your use case and you save that. At this point, our model, after all these changes are made, we know that this model kind of works for our training set of data, right? The other things you can see here is the input schema, the schema that it interpreted. Now this is in a JSON format if you wanted to use that. And you can see information like the logs that it created. Um, and here is the really important information the target visualizations. This piece actually tells you how all the attributes, so this is my target variable. This is the, here you can see how many flights were delayed versus not delayed. On the next screen, right here, if you stop, you can see all the variables and how they perform, how, how the basically histograms for how those variables are as opposed to my target variable. So if you look closely, if you see the close to holiday, it has a histogram that if you're gonna click next and we're gonna see that being close to holiday actually does impact uh, a flight delay. But things like the days of the week, it's pretty consistent until the end, which probably is the weekend is when uh, the flight delays are more because of the weekend. So right here on this screen, you can see how all the different variables in your data set correspond to the target variable you're trying to predict. So here, I'm gonna quickly go through, you can play it, uh, quickly go through one of the variables. This is the close to holiday variable that uh, we calculated used on the, based on the UDF. Can we play it, please? Thank you. And you're gonna see that it impacts, it does impact the amount of uh, delays, so how it corresponds to the variable you're trying to predict. So that, until this point, what we have done is we have created a data set, we have run it through machine learning, and looked at the model and see how that model performs. And the next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, and I'm gonna do that behind the scenes so you won't see it. Uh, I'm gonna create a data source like the last time, but this time I'm gonna create a data source of the full data set.
other questions? Yes, thank you. Here, this is the data set that I've created with the full data set. So if you look at the SQL query, it's coming up from the full slide release. And based on this data set and the model that we just created, we're going to create batch predictions. So now we are going to use the full data set to predict how uh, my model performed and what the uh, uh, you know, recommendations are from there. It's very simple. You just give it the data source that you created. You give it the machine learning model that we used. And if you, can we play, please? Thank you. These are, those are the two primary information that you need to give it. Um, you also need to give it the S3 bucket where you want the actual predictions to go. And it's going to, uh, actually at this point of time, because I'm running it on a large data set, it's also going to tell you how much it's going to cost me for a batch prediction to run. And this is just the name of the batch prediction that I'm going to run that I want to store. So here we review it. You see it's going to give me the cost estimate of how much it's going to cost me. And once this is finished, the output of it is going to be in an S3 bucket. The, this is the S3 bucket that I specified at that time. Um, if you look at it, it has a very small amount of columns. And the columns here are, one of them, the columns is best answer, and one of them is based on the threshold, if you remember, we set up a threshold value of like 0.74 something. It's going to give me a best answer. That best answer uh, talks about whether or not uh, some of uh, the flight is going to be delayed. So I copy that prediction result from S3 into a, uh, the Redshift cluster. And here we are in the QuickSight console where uh, I'm trying to connect a data connection of um, Redshift. Here is my, my table. So it's very quick, uh, and this is the SPICE engine that um, Greg was showing you about. We are ready to create an analysis based on the data. So at this point, QuickSight understands I have a data source called uh, prediction results. And very quickly, we can see that 6 p.m. is a time where the flights are most delayed. 1 a.m. is the time that the flight is least delayed. The other things I want to do is I want to you know, use things like filters uh, where I really don't care about the flight at 1 a.m. So I'm going to reduce the number of hours that are reported to 9 to 6 p.m. Uh, the other thing is the carrier. You can quickly just click on it and see what carrier has the most historic delays here. So it's very simple to click through QuickSight and actually get the analysis. Uh, and obviously, you can share this analysis with uh, your colleagues if you want to. So with that, uh, we encourage you to create your own analysis in Redshift and QuickSight uh, and uh, Amazon Machine Learning. And I invite Raj over to uh, give you a customer presentation. All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Raj Shari, uh, VP of Technology and Architecture at Vital Practice. Uh, we are in the education market business and we provide uh, digital learning and uh, content solutions for uh, school districts in the US. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about our product, Wago. Uh, I also focus more on two main data perspectives on data creators and data visualizers, and also uh, talk about how how different services of AWS that we leverage, uh, especially Redshift. So let's go. So what is Waggle? So Waggle is a, a smarter practice adaptive learning platform. Uh, it provides students with a uh, differentiated learning experience with in the moment instruction and the right challenge. Uh, it also provides students as they're learning with uh, the needed help and support um, to help them understand skills and concepts a lot better. Um, and on the other, other side, it also gives uh, teachers uh, with more, um, I would say, uh, more uh, uh, proper analytics and insights uh, with actionable data. 
So in that way, they can look at how the class is performing and how they can react to those, those decisions. So uh, what I want to focus more on is kind of give you a, a demo of our products and walk you through these two data perspectives of data creators and data visualizers so you get a bit more context about how we leverage uh, uh, Redshift uh, behind the scenes. Um, so here what you see is our, our student dashboard. Um, uh, the student is presented with a list of skills. Uh, they click on the goals that they want to work on and they get to uh, work on these different concepts by way of uh, different content that's served to them in terms of questions. Now, for a student, it's uh, not about getting the question correct or incorrect. It's all about how they're able to demonstrate the understanding of those concepts, and they're able to consistently do that. So in the event they forget a skill that they learned, say, two grades ago, uh, Waggle will automatically give you the need of remediation and get you that content for that skill so you can remember and excel on that and then help you get back on track. Um, so if you go back to your main dashboard, uh, and if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, uh, we also wanted this uh, engagement with the content to be a fun learning experience for students. So we added a lot of uh, rewards and analytics uh, <coughs> that comes with the uh, platform so students can uh, uh, gain and learn different uh, reward currency, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, by means of uh, fees and blocks. Um, so that allows them to kind of, uh, and you scroll down further, allows them to demonstrate that they're able to understand the skills and concepts, and they're also getting rewards as they're learning. So they're not just literally learning, they're also having fun with the whole process. Um, and then uh, at the same time, we also want to have the students take uh, ownership of their progress. So they're able to see their uh, progress in terms of how they're doing, or how much time they're spending, and they're al also able to uh, click on their uh, progress to see how uh, well they're doing on their skill. If we can click on that, please. Uh, they're able to s also able to see the, the progress that they're making on the drill, uh, whether they're progressing, are they learning a bit slowly, are they taking time, are they forgetting things and such. So this is what you see is all different types of data that's getting collected and computed uh, and stored into Redshift. This is data we're talking about uh, level of engagement, the amount of time a student is spending, uh, the way they're progressing on their skills, the number of goals that they've completed, the different rewards and recognition, so this is the huge amount of volume of data that every student is creating as they're learning, which is getting collected into Redshift. So now let's look at a, a different perspective. If we could go back to the slide, please. Uh, we could look at a different perspective of all this data that's collected now. Uh, how do we visualize it? How do we allow a teacher to look at this data and see how their students are working, how their class is performing? Um, when we started looking at building analytics um, and actually building visualizations, we wanted to keep uh, one core thing in mind, is that a teacher's schedule in a day is extremely, extremely busy. So we wanted to make sure any visualization that you do is giving them the, the right insight, is giving them the right story, so they know what, how, what's happening with their class. And we also wanted that data to not just be data, but we wanted that data to be completely actionable so a teacher could take decisions on things as the class is performing. So here what you see is a good example of a, uh, a, a, a class where uh, 10 students are needing help. So a teacher here could uh, scroll down a little bit, could click on that, and she could see that there are these different 10 students that are struggling. Uh, she could click on uh, one of the students, say Sarah Smith, um, and she could see that uh, she could see all the skills that Sarah Smith is struggling. So in this way, a teacher could see that uh, this is something that they taught two weeks ago, but the student is not able to grasp onto the concepts, so they need to intervene and provide the needed remediation and support for them. So with this data that they have, they can immediately take action right then and there. They could click on the Find Content button, uh, find relevant content that they can prescribe to the student, um, and if we scroll down a little bit, and from here they can see which content is applicable for them based on the skill that they're struggling. They could select the content and they could uh, uh, assign them to the students right then and there. So all this is one fluid platform where you're looking at analytics, you're looking at uh, the, uh, the performance of a class, the performance of a student, 
and you're also able to take uh, immediate action and decisions um, without even leaving the app, but interacting with the data that you're getting. Um, all this data, if you can go back, can you click on home, please? Uh, so all this data that you see is data that's surfacing from Redshift in real time. So this is data that we are aggregating, collecting, and doing a lot of pre-computes and uh, queries that are happening at runtime, and we're visualizing the data in a way that it, it tells the teacher its story, it gives them the exact insight that they're looking for, they're able to react to that data um, um, as necessary and take uh, immediate action on uh, helping a student's performance. Um, so how did we build all this? So this is Redshift. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and we'll talk about um, how the architecture of Redshift, how we came about that. So our architecture, we, we spent a lot of time building a data model. Uh, we wanted a data model to be extremely uh, flexible, malleable to change. So we took the path of building a, a lens-based uh, data model approach. So you're able to query the data from a lot of different angles, a lot of different avenues, to be able to uh, have the appropriate level of optimal performance that you want to gain out of this data. Uh, this is data that you're querying from Redshift, so you're querying billions and billions of records in real time. So you want to be very cautious about how optimal the queries are going to be. So we looked at a lot of uh, best practices with Redshift, and sort keys and distribution keys from Redshift are extremely powerful functions that come with the database that allows you to organize your data into data blocks that allow, allows you to get to uh, millions and billions of records in a, in a very fraction of a second uh, response time um, and kind of go from there. Um, we also looked at a lot of uh, read concurrency limitations that we have with uh, query queues. So we, um, we separated a lot of our uh, cluster uh, loads into two different clusters, uh, one cluster dedicated to just to do writes, one to do just reads, that allows you to separate from read-based queries versus write-based queries, so you're not uh, compromising on your performance uh, as you're writing data and also reading data from the same cluster, but you're able to separate your workloads based on the specific need that we want you as a cluster for. Um, um, and then a lot of uh, best practices and uh, metrics that we saw. Uh, we looked at a lot of, um, um, you know, alert tables, stack tables out of Redshift that allowed us to look at if your queries are using nested loops, cartridges and products, because those are really expensive in terms of data retrieval. So you want to minimize those. Uh, we looked at a lot of uh, WLM configurations to make sure our query memory processing are tuned correctly, our resources are utilized the right way. So you're able to separate uh, different users running queries to make sure your most expensive query has the li right level of capacity available, uh, plus your regular queries that take least amount of time has the you know, least amount of capacity available to run through those. Um, we also looked at a lot of alert tables that come with Redshift as well that gives you a quick indication of monitoring your performance and seeing how your queries are performing. Are you running a lot of commit queues? Are you running a lot of request queues? Are you sending a lot of data that's uh, not actually what you want? Uh, are you doing a lot of hash joins? A lot of, if your keys are not organized correctly, how are they working? So it gives you a good indication about how that works as well. Uh, looking at all this best practices, we were able to uh, use uh, load and load commands for S3 to load data, uh, millions of records into Redshift in less than a few seconds. Um, we are also, uh, so queries that we had, uh, most complex queries to uh, most frequently used queries to run under a second uh, in a few milliseconds, and some of the most complex queries take about a second and a half to run. Uh, this is again, sifting through millions and billions of records uh, real time by all the teachers who are looking at those report metrics. Uh, we also introduced compression into the mix as well that allows us to gain an additional 20% of performance into data retrieval, um, all looking at uh, just purely organizing your data in a way that you can get to it a lot, lot faster than traditional relational databases or any other databases that you want to uh, build for that. Um, so uh, this is uh, some metrics about since we launched Waggle in July 2014, we have clocked over 800,000 hours in the system. 
uh, over 36 million responses that have been uh, submitted by students that are coming in every day, uh, over uh, 16 million recommendations of uh, questions and items that are recommended to students as they're learning uh, on a daily basis. Um, so with that, I want to uh, thank you for your time. We are uh, really excited about what we're doing with WAGO and working with AWS to build a platform. And uh, you know, we are uh, definitely helping uh, shape the future of education and we are really excited to do that every day. So thank you. Okay, normally I get yelled at when I go fast, but I've got four minutes and 44 <laughs> seconds. So you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. Uh, my name is Lai Tinsley, I'm with Ivy Tech, I'm the Chief Technology Officer there. Uh, you guys were in the keynote this morning, you heard Teresa mention us a little bit. Briefly, so what we're doing, oops, wow, this thing is really sensitive. All right, let's go back. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is transform um, Ivy Tech into a more data-driven organization. So we use uh, a lot of different technologies to do that. Certainly, we're using Redshift from uh, an analytics perspective, and we're trying to form within the college what we call a data democracy. So that what that really means is getting all the folks, and if anybody's in education, you know what I'm talking about here, getting them to think about data differently. Um, Colleges have been educating folks the same way for the last 300 years or so that I can figure. And so getting them to look at it differently and treat that data differently has been a challenge, but we're getting, making some progress and Redshift and Amazon has helped us do that. <clears throat> so let me skip a couple things here. So some of these slides were put together by some other folks, so I'm gonna skip them in the essence of time. <clears throat> So the standard approach that Ivy Tech and every, about every other higher ed that I've seen and every other business that I've worked in has adopted is this. So there's a, there's a group of folks that have access to data. They're behind a walled fortress. Sometimes it's guarded. People that need data really have a hard time getting it. They ask, hey, can you write a report for me? And then some you know, measure of time later, you'll get that. So really what we're trying to do is change that and get data into the hands of people as they need it. So uh, we sort of divvy this up into data regimes, and so if, I won't read this to you, but if you have a minute and you can kind of glance through it, I'm sure most of you have an organization that fits in one of these. Um, we're really trying to get away from the anarchy, which is where a lot of businesses live, down into the data democracy. And what that really means is getting data into the hands of people that need it and let them get it themselves. So <clears throat> let me zip through a couple things. So at Ivy, oh boy, this thing is really, Okay, so at Ivy Tech, as in a lot of organizations, we have a lot of systems. We support today, I wanna say about 1,200 applications and about 1,199 of them have their own reporting environment, um, which, <laughs> can you begin? Let me go back. I'm just not gonna touch it, so there we go. Um, so they all have their reporting environment. So one of the approaches we've taken with Redshift is to stop requiring our users to log in to 1,100 different systems to run a report on a snippet of data. So what we've really done is, using Redshift, is we bring all that data together and we manage what we call collections. So with student affairs, for example, we have data related to students. And that's a curated data set that we've pulled from, I think with the student section, I think there's about 40 different systems. We bring all that together, aggregate it, and present that to our folks through a BI tool called Pentaho, if you guys are familiar with Pentaho. <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid to touch it now. There we go. So I'll uh, give you a few examples of what our student collections look like. And these are pulled from a variety of different systems. And so, for example, um, what do we got up there? Luminous is our portal. It's our web portal that our students log into. Request Tracker is our help desk system. Um, Starfish is our student advising system. So what that allows to do, the registrars, for example, to log in and say, I want to see how Wendy is doing. And it will, it will show them all aspects of Wendy as a student not Wendy in the SIS system, not Wendy in the advising system, but just Wendy as a person. That has really enabled us to do a lot of really fantastic things and allowed us to do a lot of neat stuff with machine learning that I'm not gonna have time to talk about. Good, it didn't move. So one of the real key, keys to this, and this has been a challenge with our organization, we've got about 24,000 faculty and staff in the system, about 9,000 of those are active today, is coming up with a standard data dictionary. So, oddly enough, in education, if I asked two people what a student is, I would get four different answers from those two different people. Um, and that's not a joke. So, what we've done is we've came up with a standard data dictionary and went across our whole organization and said, this is the definition for a student. And we made them all agree to it, sort of. And so, we integrate this into our BI solution so that when a, a user runs a report, they just mouse over that field and it tells them exactly what that field is. 
And so again, that's a culture change in higher ed. We've never had that before, and from what I can tell, no other college does. Um, and that's been a big deal and very helpful. So I've got 22 seconds if anyone has a question. <laughs> We kind of went uh, quick through the things, but here's some, uh, you know, the, the point of today's session was to think about, you know, the different personas we talked about, the few use cases, and, and, you know, figure out for your analytic use case which set of services can help uh, solve your individual uh, challenges, and then gave a couple of examples of how some existing customers are doing that. So uh, the slides will be posted, uh, but here's additional uh, links to kind of help with uh, some advanced topics, and we'll be available either up front or uh, if we get kicked out of the room in the hallway to answer your questions. But Thanks for attending and uh, enjoy your sessions.